really nice to hear someone talking about this in a very level-headed uh, way with facts. Uh, it's great, you know. Just to give you a quick bio. You're a professor of psychiatry, forensic psychiatrist, doctor of medicine, uh, natural healing consultant, highly qualified molecular biologist. So you're, you're listening to the right guy, uh, uh, people, you know. And you work with cancer. I asked um, Dr. Uh, Andrew if I could open up with a, a little clip book from a doctor which I found who was talking about he was being told to rig the numbers, literally. And, and it's very, very frightening what we're looking at. Andrew's going to tell us a lot of truths here tonight. And because um, there's no doubt that the people are dying of cancer is being used as, 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 as coronavirus instead. People are dying and they're banging the coronavirus on the death certificate, which we're going to talk about a lot now. But uh, can I just play that clip quick, Andrew, before we start? Yeah, please do. Thank you. said, I think is critically important. Can you repeat what you just said, please? Well, last Friday, I received a seven page document that sort of told me that if I had an 86 year old patient that had pneumonia, but was never tested for COVID-19. But sometime after she came down with pneumonia, we learned that she had been exposed to her son who had no symptoms, but later on was identified with COVID-19, that it would be appropriate to diagnose on the death certificate COVID-19. Someone has the pneumonia after, and, and it's in the middle of a flu epidemic, and I don't have a test on influenza. I don't diagnose influenza on the death certificate. I will say uh, this elderly patient Sir, died of pneumonia. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I, my heart is sinking right now as you're telling me this. You're, you're a doctor. Why in the world would they be sending you out information to fill out death certificates, whether the person's been diagnosed with COVID-19 or not, but then to say in the death certificate this person's death was caused by COVID-19? That, that does not sound right to me. I went to the person in our office who does most of the death certificates over the last you know, 10, 20 years, and I said, does this sound right? I had her look at the documents that I had printed off, and she said, well, we've always been told that you always put down just facts. You don't put down any probabilities. You don't put any presumptions down. It's just what you know. And so this is concerning. And, and it actually gets to your point, Chris. When we start talking about the data that goes into the modeling, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we being forthright? Are we sharing with the public? Minnesota, North Dakota, we don't need to be having it sugar-coated. We want to know but what's going into your modeling? So with that being said, why would they want to skew the number of deaths due to COVID-19? Well, fear is a great way to control people. And I worry about that. I worry that sometimes we're so darn interested in just jazzing up the fear factor. And, um, you know, I think what, uh, what the person was talking about uh, has to do with the death certificate reporting and how they collect the statistics to see who has actually died uh, of this virus, uh, alleged virus, COVID-19. And um, there, there are several uh, issues that introduce a lot of error into this data collection. So uh, some of them just have to do with the testing themselves, uh, itself, because uh, the testing has never been validated against a gold standard. And a gold standard is where they would actually measure the virus. The test doesn't measure the virus, it measures uh, genetic material. Uh, which can be uh, is a separate thing and may not be uh, nearly as accurate. Um, some preliminary studies have shown a false positive rate up to 80%, but those are estimations because since there's no gold standard for comparison, it can't be an, an error rate can't be calculated accurately. So in other words, we don't even know how accurate the test is because we can't calculate that because there's no basis of comparison. And I think I know what is really going on here, so I want to give that information to everyone. Um, I want everyone to know that I, I am a qualified uh, medical doctor, um, so I put up some information about my background here. Um, I'm board certified. I practice in psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. Um, I also do natural healing consultation. Um, in the past, I've worked in hematology and oncology. I've held leadership positions in uh, medical school. I ran a uh, medical device startup company, um, and you can see where I had my education. So I feel that I am uh, qualified to talk about this subject matter, and I hope you'll agree. So if uh, what we had is a situation where just about 200 people at first uh, became ill with a mysterious um, pneumonia type illness at this seafood market, 
and many of the people were uh, actually employed or made their livelihood at the market. So I want to ask uh, the audience out there, if you uh, learned about this information, what would be your first thought about what most likely might be the problem that caused this mysterious illness? So would it be A, a new genetic disease like cystic fibrosis? Would it be B, a new virus, a new viral illness? Would it be C, autoimmune disease where the body is attacking itself, causing the problem? Or would it simply be bad seafood? And I think most of you would agree that the first thought you'd have, given the commonality of the market and the sanitary conditions there, is that bad seafood would be an issue and something certainly to look into. However, the scientists in China did not agree. And in fact, they did not look into this issue at all, as far as I can tell. But instead, they jumped right into the possibility of a virus. So this is a quote from the first paper from the, uh, the group there that uh, claims to have identified uh, this uh, new coronavirus. And what they said is, the disease was determined as viral induced pneumonia by clinicians according to clinical symptoms, um, including basically a fever, uh, low white blood cell count. Uh, pulmonary, pulmonary infiltrates just means uh, fluid and congestion in the lungs on a chest x-ray. And the people did not get better after three days of antibiotics. So they, they did think of, of a bacterial infection first and then went right to the virus. And they note that most of the early cases had contact with the seafood market. So it sounds like they, they were primed to blame a virus on this, on this uh, illness right away. So how did they actually um, uh, claim to have proved that a virus call, caused this illness? So what they did is they, they took seven, only seven out of, the, out of the almost 200 initial patients who were sick, and they uh, stuck uh, basically a fiber optic camera, like a long tube, down their windpipe into their lungs, and then they squirted a bunch of fluid in there. Um, and mixed it around and it, it collected whatever debris or cells or uh, chemicals were, were in the lungs and then they sucked it back up. And they did take some other body fluids, they did take blood, they took oral swabs and nasal swabs, but, but it's the lung fluid where they really uh, found what they, or think they found what they were looking for. So when they took this lung fluid out, they did not first try to find a virus in there and separate it out and purify it but the first thing they did was find and separate some kind of genetic material. Quite an interesting strategy, and what they found was some RNA. So when they found this genetic material from the lung fluid, they then uh, determined the sequence of it, which is basically the code of the genetic material. And then they rushed to rapidly develop a diagnostic test, which is a, a qualitative PCR, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. So, in other words, before they really proved anything, they already developed a test, okay? So, why didn't they purify the virus, and how do they know what the source is of that genetic material? So, it turns out that I um, was looking in a, a related area, and I found this study from last summer, and this study was trying to also develop a, a diagnostic test, but for lung cancer. And essentially, they used the same exact procedure. So they got the lung fluid in the same way with that bronchoalveolar lavage, and they collected that fluid, and out of that fluid, they isolated genetic material, and they sequenced that and uh, tried to, they called it a possible biomarker, and this could be a test for lung cancer. So I thought it was, uh, it was quite interesting and coincidental that the same exact procedure was developing a diagnostic test for lung cancer as was developing a diagnostic test for this pandemic pneumonia. So let's look uh, a little bit more in detail at this test. So this is a, uh, that RT-PCR stands for, it's a mouthful, but it's reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And the RT part refers to that we're using it to to amplify RNA rather than DNA. If we were using it to amplify DNA, it would just be called PCR. Okay, now I'll tell you some important things about this test. So the most important thing is it's not actually testing for the virus itself, it's testing for a sequence of RNA. Now that sequence of RNA may be present in a virus, but it also may be present in other things. Whenever you're evaluating a new test, you need to compare it to the gold standard. 
And that's how you know if it's actually valid. With this COVID-19 test, there has not been any gold standard test that this has been compared to because the uh, supposed COVID-19 virus has never been purified. If we were able to take that, purify out a virus particle that we could identify, then we would be able to have a gold standard. And so the way you would test this PCR is you would have a group of sick patients, and then you would have a control group of healthy patients. You would perform the gold standard test so you'd be able to identify the virus out of each of those patients. And then you would compare the results of the PCR test to that gold standard. And that is really critical because it would allow you to, to determine or calculate an error rate because no test is perfect. It's also very, very important that you have that control group because that control group would not have the virus present at all and would also should have a negative PCR test. Um, and that's very important in order to help you calculate these error rates. So one example of a type of error that I think we'd be very concerned about because we don't want to be mislabeled as being positive for this alleged virus and then risk being quarantined or perhaps even detained. So we want to know the accuracy. Now there was a paper that came out um, where they, they had to estimate the false positive rate because you can't calculate it since there's no gold standard to compare it against. And they actually reported an estimated rate of 80% um, in people without symptoms. So what that means is if you got tested, let's say you were uh, exposed to somebody who tested positive uh, or you traveled or something like that and you want to get tested or you're, you're asked to get tested, there would be four out of five times that there was a positive result, there would actually be no illness. So this could be a real, real big problem. It certainly could vastly overestimate the number of cases and also could have a lot of consequences uh, for you based on this quarantine situation. So just to talk generally about what the PCR test, because there's actually additional error even beyond what I've described. So what this test does is it's really just an amplification strategy. And the reason this is necessary is because we're, we're kind of looking for a needle in the haystack. So replicates the strand of RNA uh, and it makes uh, a copy. And this is an exponential or a binomial expansion. And if you look at the uh, black uh, curve on the graph here, you'll see that's what that represents. So um, generally speaking, when you're using this test, you want to carry out a approximately between 25 and 35 cycles in order to get enough amplification that you can see what you're looking for. If you go too much beyond that, what happens is you end up amplifying the noise. So it seems to be generally represented that the absolute maximum number of cycles that you could do and still get an accurate result is 45. And that's exactly the number of cycles that is recommended for this COVID-19 PCR test. So it's right at the upper limit. And I'm gonna share this quote with you uh, from another article about PCR. It says, what PCR does is to select a genetic sequence and then amplify it enormously. It can accomplish the equivalent of finding a needle in a haystack. It can amplify that needle into a haystack. Like an electronically amplified antenna, PCR greatly amplifies the signal, but also greatly amplifies the noise. Since the amplification is exponential, the slightest error in measurement, the slightest contamination, can result in errors of many orders of magnitude. So this is not a very accurate test, especially when you're pushing the number of cycles to get so much amplification. Uh, just a slight mistake can result in false positives. And I think that's, that's what we've been seeing.